Welcome to the One Away Show, presented by BW Missions. I am Brian Wish, and I am your host, and thanks so much for being here. On this show, I sit down with compelling entrepreneurs, authors, and rising leaders to talk through their most transformative relationships, experiences, and epiphanies. Curated with entrepreneurial leaders in mind, we'll dig into these finite moments in people's lives and understand how they helped set their path forward. Chris Cheney is an award-winning serial entrepreneur, Forbes 30 Under 30 winner, and startup mentor with a 15-year leadership track record of success in global sports, esports, and entertainment industries. A native of Germany, he is an angel investor and the startup advisor to 30 companies across esports, gaming, consumer, and entertainment, and other verticals. Chris started his career in the NBA and also found the Ivy Sports Symposium, a widely recognized nonprofit organization that promoted the development of young leaders in the global sports industry. Most recently, he was the founder of Infinite Esports Entertainment, which was acquired by Immortals Gaming Club. Chris proudly serves on the board of Rise Above the Disorder, a nonprofit dedicated to making mental health care accessible to everyone. Currently, he is the founder of C4 Plus, an esports, gaming, sports, and entertainment holdings and investment company, and holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Princeton University. Chris, welcome to the One Away Show. Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. It's been fun to build a relationship the past year and excited to hear about your one away moment to, uh, today. Uh, so what what is it, Chris? I know when we were talking beforehand, you uh, seemed like it had a lot, a lot of weight behind it, but not sure what you're going to share. So I'm excited. Yeah, well, my um, really a, a, a special moment for me was um, when I, um, I, I just graduated from college um, eight months prior, and I was in my first job, which was supposed to be my dream job, um, working in New York City, um, Midtown Manhattan uh, at the National Basketball Association. And my told my boss that I was leaving, that I was quitting. Um, and the weight that uh, fell off my shoulders um, in that moment, <laughs> and just the, the, how liberating it felt that I told her, yeah, I'm, I'm out. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my own thing. It was, um, it was really special. I mean, I, uh, you know, again, young college kid, first job. And, and, and I thought this was it, you know, I landed in the perfect position. Um, and quote unquote was on top of the world. And, you know, here I realized, um, a few months into it that I, um, you know, it just, just wasn't it. And so I, um, I, uh, told her I'm leaving, I'm out. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and that, that really shaped me, I think for, uh, for many years to come that, that moment. And, and what for me was a really, really tough, it was, it, 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 it was, it was the right decision for me, um, but it was so hard to make it until I actually did make it. Um, yeah, that was uh, that was that was a lot. Hmm. I know. So this is about you. I want to make this about your story. And the, the moment, though, I know so well, Chris. Uh, I was supposed to work in sports business after college. I worked in it all throughout college. And I had a job in New York at a big agency, Ivory Tower, and I accepted I accepted the job. And right before I was supposed to go up to New York, I, I called the guy and I said, I'm not going, I'm pursuing my own thing. So I remember the, the feeling, it was momentous weight off the shoulders when I just said, I'm going for it. Um, so I, I'm connecting with you on that saying, it's very hard uh, to do. And you were young. I'm I'm curious though, Chris, uh, you made that decision and were you always entrepreneurial in some ways or did it just feel so wrong that you knew that you had to go a different direction? Yeah, I think, um, I, it was almost 
you know, when I graduated, it was almost like I was repressing my entrepreneurial spirit by getting a job because it felt like, well, that's the thing you do after college, you get a job, right? And um, I think if I had maybe reflected more or looked a little more inward, I would have realized that even without a specific idea or concept, company in mind, entrepreneurship was the path path that I should take. But I just thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm have this great opportunity. I should be getting a, um, you know, should be getting a quote unquote real job. And so I, um, you know, I, I've, I've always had sort of this, 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 um, entrepreneurial streak starting things um so i actually did create a company in college um an apparel brand um a basketball lifestyle apparel brand didn't go anywhere <laughs> that was freshman sophomore year but it was a great experience i even won some uh, some money some startup capital in a business plan contest on campus um i did various events and different activities that were very entrepreneurial but for some reason i just didn't I just and maybe in some ways I just didn't know, you know, mm -hmm. that there was this path that I could take, this path of entrepreneurship. And not until having a quote unquote real job and seeing what that's like and how it felt very limiting to me and just not an not an not the opportunity that I saw for myself. Um, that's when I realized, wow, entrepreneurship, that that is actually who I am. I, 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 it was all, it was there all along. You know, it's one of those things you, it's there all along, but you don't see it until you don't have it or you don't, you know, you, 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 it's somehow being, you know, being, being shielded away from you to know, well, that's where I need to be. Right. And I, I completely agree. I loved what you said about looking more inward uh, and knowing that was the path for you all along. I, I, my, question is what um what enabled maybe that intuition to open up and become so clear i mean you were only there eight months was there a specific moment like being late up at night late in bed and just not being able to sleep because it was so overwhelming i mean what what allowed for you to really see it because some people spend three four or five years miserable and you you acted on it fairly quickly yeah. So, I, I mean, I think you, you hit it right on the nail, feeling miserable or being miserable. I, I really didn't like, and that's no, you know, that's no knock on the, the, the company that I was working for or, or my team. For me, it wasn't the right fit. And so I, you know, I woke up every morning not wanting to go to the office, not, not being motivated to go to the office. And, and then the commute to work and the walk to work, it just, I just, it just didn't feel like it was me. And, um, and I've, I think I've always been very action or solutions oriented, where if I'm a particular, in a particular situation that I look for a way, especially if it's not a good situation, um, I look, I, I look for a solution, you know, okay, here's a problem. How do I solve it? And I just couldn't, you know, after a while, I just, I just had to tell myself, this situation is not good. I need to solve it. It's a problem. I need to solve it. And the solution is I need to leave. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't have a business plan. There was no, you know, grand concept, you know, billion dollar opportunity I was pursuing. I just knew I, I couldn't do this, right? I couldn't do this job um that really wasn't meant for me um but it, it just you know really just came to a head where um i do recognize for some people that process takes a really long time to make that final call to make that decision and for some it never happens for me it just i, I at one point i just knew i said like I, I just can't keep doing this there's just there's just no way i just this is it i'm this this just has to be it Yep. Yep. I, I applaud you, you know, for doing that. And I just I think the body really 
it can tell you and like it was looking at you you felt it and, and you've listened and you chose to listen to it before it got worse and so i think for those listening who a lot of young ambitious entrepreneurial types who listen to this uh i think there's a lot of important lessons in what you just shared and uh, and you know one more note on that brian i you know in hindsight and even today I feel you can always get a quote unquote real job. Mm -hmm. You can always do that. I mean, there's, you know, corporate world's big, lots of companies, you know, recession or, you know, so, you know, economic upheaval aside, you can always get a job. But if you really want to pursue something for yourself, there's no better moment than to do it now. Um, You know, of course, everyone has their own unique personal, financial, family, et cetera, circumstances. But if you really want to build something for yourself, build it now. The corporate world will always be there. The companies come and go, but the corporate jobs, the real quote unquote real jobs, they're always out there, you know? And and so you can always, in my mind, come back to that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. There, there will always be corporate jobs out there to fill and or you can create your own jobs for others to fill. Uh, yeah. Chris, speaking of that, you, you, the time was now back then for you. Uh, you left. What, what was your next steps? I mean, what, what did you end up doing? Um, next step was uh, um, one, just feeling super relieved. And then I think just, just diving into some projects that I saw um that had come to me or that i thought i could 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 work on create um i i just really didn't i i you know i didn't there was there's no pause there's no you know let's let's sit back and plan for the next few months it was just how can i dive into something right away from from the get go the next day basically <laughs> um and uh and 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 you know maybe i should have done some more planning because everything had been very organic um so i i i, I sometimes I, I wonder whether some planning would have been helpful and my 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 conclusion is probably so um but my personality is I want to do things, you know, I want to build things. Um, so I said, I'm, well, I didn't even say anything. I just did it. <laughs> um, jumped head first into a few projects, uh, none of which worked out, actually. <laughs> um, they were all pretty much failures, um, but uh, lots of failures. Um, but lots, lots it, of learning. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, I don't know if it felt in the moment it felt like that because you're disappointed that something's not happening and something's falling through. But um, but I'm also a person who, just from a personality perspective, I can work on something for a year straight, realize it doesn't work, move it aside, and not think about it. Not you know, some people they get really hung up on wow, I worked on something for a year and it didn't happen and I lost all this time and, and maybe money and, 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 and like I, I feel like a failure. For me, that isn't the case. Um, I just, I'm very, I can very uh, purposefully push things aside and focus on the next thing. Even if what I pushed aside was a year's worth of effort or so, I'm, I'm very comfortable just pushing it aside and moving on and not beating myself up, not getting hung up too much on this perceived failure of a project. Because I look at it as, did I do everything I could to put me and this project in the best chance of, you know, put, put our us into the best chance to, to succeed, um, give ourselves the best chance to succeed? And if that answer is yes, I'm good. If it fails, I'm good. If it succeeds, I'm good. But I know that I did everything. And I've had a bunch of projects like this where I spent a lot of time, a lot of effort. And I felt like we were so close and they didn't happen. But um, I would do it all over again because I believed in it. I put everything into it. It failed. Let's move on. Love that. Chris, something that, you know, 
you, I think two things that came out of what you just said, I think a level of resilience uh, and also maybe a level of compartmentalization to be able to move on from one thing to the next. If I could maybe build on that, dive deep, if there's anything here, were you, how are you raised as a kid or did you have any experiences growing up that maybe shaped you where, you know, allowed you to be more adaptable, you know, right after college as you were in a more of experimentation mode and finding what was more soulful and aligned? Well, I, I think, um, uh, I, so one, I, you know, I didn't grow up, grow up in the U S I grew up in Germany. Uh, my first time living in the U S was for college. I'd never lived in the U.S. I'd never spoken English every day except in school, uh, learning it because it's not my first language. Um, So I came to the U.S. um, uh, as a German kid uh, and uh, with, you know, a a German accent and um, just kind of, you know, finding my way. My entire family was in Germany, uh, so they kind of dropped me off here in New Jersey and um uh, they flew back to germany and um you know here i was at a you know at a school that you know demanded a lot and had a lot of smart kids and, and kids from all over the world so you just i don't know i just got thrown into that and um and the that that unknown a culture and environment that i was not used to i think just helped me also find my strengths um and 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 where and how i can excel and it is partly that um compartmentalizing that resilience um you know being methodical um i feel like a lot i i own a lot of those skills or 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 traits perhaps in in college but i but i but i actually you know I'd, i'd also just credit that that's maybe how i'm hardwired it's like it's i'm not even sure if like the, I think there are some things that you you just are you just are a certain way, and then it's up to you to maybe fine tune or hone in on those those innate traits. Uh, and for some people that might be resilient for resi- resilience, sorry. For some people that might be creativity. Um, for some people that might be you know, I don't know, analytical thinking, or they're, you know, they're very analytically minded, but, but you, you have to nourish that. Um, and so I feel like um, both in college and then even in, in, in high school, I, you know, I had the, uh, uh, you know, I, I was in the right environment that allowed me to nourish what I think I already had in terms of this, you know, resilience and this very much this solutions action oriented mindset and a certain relentlessness um because uh you know you always <laughs> i don't know i mean i i think when i was applying for colleges you know german small german high school and i don't think anyone from my school ever went to a u.s college and i think i was the first one ever to go to a u.s college and um and so of course i had you know, some kids that say, oh, you're applying to all these schools and you're not going to get in and you're not going to get accepted. Um, And just who I am, I shrug that off and I just stay focused, right? That's the resilience in me. So things kind of get thrown at me and I undeterred, just keep focused, keep pushing. And so I, I think that was, you know, just, Again, I, I've had these these windows of opportunity throughout my life where where I where I was fine tuning and owning in on what I already had, and maybe in other in, you know for other people they would have gone the complete opposite route where they would have said, oh man, maybe I shouldn't apply, maybe I should you know stay here and do something close by, uh, but for me the 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 reaction was. No, I'm doubling down on this. I'm, I'm I'm doing this because I believe in it. So um so yeah, so I think in part just being that to me is innate. There were opportunities or moments along the way that 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 pushed me to become more resilient, uh become more determined, really focused and solutions oriented, 
Um, and, um, and then, yeah, just college was this great blossoming experience and, uh, had a, had a really great time. So cool. Chris, I did not know that. Maybe you told me a year ago, but I did not know that you grew up in Germany yeah. and you, you pushed past all the brushes to, to get to the U S and kind of set a path forward for you, which is unbelievable. I mean, I know from what I understand in, in abroad countries coming to a top school in the U S is, is a dream. And, and you, you made it happen because you were resilient and could push past the noise and stay focused. So uh, no surprises there, uh, but also a very cool story indeed. Uh, I'd like to, you know, Chris, with that transition, kind of segue to, you know, the path that you you have chosen uh, of entrepreneurship. I mean, I, I know after college, you know, you were in experimentation mode, maybe had a few projects that didn't work out when in hindsight or were probably blessings in disguise, but when did you start, my question for you is, when did you start maybe seizing momentum or seeing some things come out, come up aligned uh, in a way where you knew that you were on the right track? Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so, so early on when I, when I left my, you know, very comfortable job, uh, entry level uh, job, I, um, I, I, um, you know, I, like you said, I was working on these projects, and they were a little bit scattered, and and weren't weren't really all that good. But but while working on these projects, what I saw was I'm interested in niches. Um, I'm interested in these niche opportunities that maybe not everyone is looking at. Back then, I was too young, not experienced enough, didn't quite have the right connectivity, you know, the right relationships and the ability to make things happen. Um, but but later on, that focus on niches and now my work in esports and gaming, it's really come full circle. But I noticed that as soon as I left my job, I know I, I, I was working on these niche projects. And I started to think as I was working on them and as the, you know, the first couple of years of, of, of failed entrepreneurship went by, um, that, that, that there's an opportunity for me to build things and work on opportunities and projects in these um, almost obscure areas. Mm-hmm. Um, and that ultimately brought me to um, working on, um, you know, the two biggest deals of my career. Um, in niche areas of the sports industry where you know other people weren't looking or weren't looking yet and where even i as a younger guy and you know aspiring entrepreneur um could carve out something for myself and successfully finally (laughs) successfully uh work on um work on some projects so so that was the that was the thing that i that to me was my lightning in a bottle, mm-hmm. recognizing that I thrive in, that, that I have a unique ability to identify niches bef- and niche opportunities before other people do. And, and, and what also kind of drove that home for me was um, I, you know, I was looking at these different, you know, companies and potential projects and I was, you know, I was reaching out to people and, 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 and looking for, 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 for projects to work on. And as those people, you know, there's one company I reached out to because I thought this company could be the perfect company to raise capital for. Because I thought I, I know some investors and sort of, I'm not in like, I wasn't a finance guy. It wasn't really my world, but I thought this company is really onto something. I, I just, I see it, you know, I'm following their socials. I'm looking at their products. This company is poised. So reached out to the CEO, chased him, chased him, chased him, chased him. And I think once or twice got a response, nothing ever came out of it. A few months later, they announced this massive investment, huge investment. Um, and I just knew, okay, I was really on to something here. I, you know, maybe I was a couple of weeks too, too late or, or just didn't have the right, you know, name recognition, 
But I was really on to something here because this is a big deal. And I can guarantee you not many other people saw it. And and that was a this was this was this aha moment for me of just I think I really get it. You know, I really get these niche opportunities that other people don't see or don't see yet. And that's been the common thread throughout my entire career. It's been all about niches. Super cool. Uh, I'd I'd love to, uh, two things. One, if you can share, I'd be curious what the company was that you identified. Uh, Uh And then two, do you have, as you said, it's been the common thread throughout your career. Do you have a common set of criteria you're looking for? How do you know where to like put your line in the water to find a niche? I mean, <laughs> is it natural? I'm just, I'm just curious it, like, think about, like if tomorrow I said, go find a niche, what would you do next? Uh, hunting and fishing. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is actually an interesting uh, emerging niche. So, um, but it, it's, yeah, obviously it's already quite big. Um, so this company specifically was a sports uh, nutritional supplements brand. Um, I think I started seeing it in stores or you know, I was working out at the time. I was using, you know, different like pre-workout, you know, protein shake stuff, what have you. Um, and uh and and I and I came across this brand and I thought, okay, this this brand, it looks good. I like the products. Um, let me look at where they're from. You know, let's check out their website. And it just clicked. I said, this company is poised for big things. Uh, they were a small brand at the time. Uh, and I thought um, these guys are really onto something. It was it was partly a gut feeling for sure across the board for me this is just it has to resonate there's like this gut sense that I have and it has to resonate um, and then also just looking at again looking at you know so- social media having in that particular case tried uh, one or two of their um, sports uh, supplement products uh, which are now available everywhere you can imagine the company is huge you can there's not a store where you cannot buy their products. That's well, how it's there. What's the name of it? Um, so they've changed names um, once or twice. I think now they're going under, um, so when I was first, inter- when I first discovered them, they were called Wood Bolt, like the Bolt, B-O-T, Wood Bolt International, Wood Bolt Distribution. Uh, and then I think they became Nutra Bolt, um, and their most well-known um, uh, brand is C4, uh, Cellucor. I know C4. Yeah, so it's like, I mean, C4 is like the uh, pre-workout. It's probably the most well-known pre-workout, uh, certainly in the U.S., bar, bar none. Um, and um, so I, you know, I was looking at these guys or, you know, again, from a complete outsider's perspective, and um, uh, and they had uh, secured an investment in uh, 2014, uh, six years ago, way before they were as big as they are. And um, uh, yeah, and I just uh, um, and I reached out. I think in in uh, in in late 2013 or so is when I reached out to them. And then several months later, they announced this huge deal with a massive private equity firm. And um, I just knew that. You know, okay, wow, I'm really, I really get it. Well, not, not, not in a um, boastful manner or anything, but just this gut feeling mm-hmm. and then just looking around a little bit. Uh, and so this, this was one where um, I think if I had been where I am today, both in terms of experience and relationships, that's an opportunity I think I could have potentially worked on or project could have potentially been in, you know, sort of involved in potentially. Um, but of course, back then I just, you know, that was, those were the early days. Um, but I, um, mixed martial arts is another one I saw early. Um, 
prior to the rise of the UFC, before it became this multi-billion dollar juggernaut. Um, so I saw MMA. That was on the personal side a little bit as well. I was um, dabbling in, in MMA a bit, um, just for fun with a friend from, from back home. And, uh, and, 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 and I got even more interested. I was interested as a, as a sort of a fan, a casual fan, and then dabbling in it a bit personally. And I felt like, okay, this, this, this sport is really making waves. Um, so I was working um, in the space, um, in the MMA space. Um, and, then, uh, and then I was al also very early in the uh, obstacle course racing space, uh, which was this, um, you know, when the whole CrossFit movement and these, you know, fun races or themed races and obstacle course races, they all kind of collided um, around a similar time. Um, so that's also an opportunity that I, I saw um, uh, quite early. And when you said you were very early, right? I think there's a theme here around sports as well. But when you say you were early, I mean, were you creating opportunities and deals and things in the spaces at the time? I mean, can, can, what are you, can you share? Yeah, so, yeah so, so in mixed martial arts, I actually ended up working with a brand and helped them raise capital. Um, with a, uh, a consumer brand in mixed martial arts. Um, so they were doing um, gloves and fight shorts and headgear and, um, you know, all the related uh, performance apparel and technical equipment in the space. Um, and then in the obstacle course ring, ra uh, sorry, obstacle course racing space, I was one, um, helping an investor that was investing in one of the leading uh, events companies in the space, um, um, actually called, uh, it's called Spartan Race. Um, uh, still, you know, last man standing today after many years now um, uh, and uh, helping uh, uh, their investor at the time with a, with a bit of due diligence. Um, and then also working with Spartan Race um, and helping them think through some uh, sponsorship opportunities at the time. Um, again, this was seven, eight years or so ago. And, um, and this was prior again to this sport just absolutely exploding. Um, it's, it's obviously has had its, um, its, its difficulties over the years. Uh, with companies like Tough Mudder going bankrupt. Um, but Spartan Race, the one that I had high hopes on, is still the strongest and still, you know, doing doing well. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was that that was my work. Uh, so sponsorships and partnerships and and investments and uh, and that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, so whether it's obstacle course racing or mixed martial arts or sports supplements, um, it's it's always been this like just seeing, I guess, seeing both niches and entrepreneurs in those niches that I felt were poised to do great things. So not just, I guess, the, the niches themselves, but also the entrepreneurs that were building companies within them. Um, and I've been very fortunate to come across and work with many incredible um, fellow entrepreneurs. Mm. So it's a it's a bit of a knack and eye for talent development as well of, of what someone at the helm can can lead and create along with really knowing the space and getting the feel for it with you know yeah. sort of quantitative metrics as well. Um, <laughs> Chris, um, I think it's really interesting how you have been at the front line. I'm curious as to what you see as next in the sports arena, but I know that you know to kind of dive into, I think, a topic around esports, which you've also been, I think, very much on the front lines of before it's blown up. Uh, how do you identify esports as maybe the next frontier? And what do you see as the opportunities within? I mean, it's expansive beyond measure. I'm just curious how you're looking at it and what led you to it based on the conversation around niches and sports. Yeah, I. Uh, it's one of those, another one of those just you know, random conversations. I was doing, um, I was doing a weekly LinkedIn post at the time and just, you know, stumbling across interesting articles. And I saw a couple that were mentioning esports. Um, 
esports in the context of China was a, already a topic back then. This was 2015, um, maybe. Yeah, I think it was about 2015. So now already, I don't know, half a decade ago, <laughs> um, which in this space is a very long time. Um, and um, and so I ended up connecting with someone who works for one of the major video game publishers um, called Riot Games, and um, and I didn't know really anything about um, or much at all about esports and the games and the space. And um, he gave me a little bit of a crash course. This you know on this. Friday late afternoon call um, and, you know, heading into the weekend, it probably was my last call that day. And so just like, in a, you know, like in a very uh, spongy mindset, just, you know, just soaking it all up that he was sharing. And, um, and I was just floored, really. Uh, I was just amazed. I left the conversation both smiling and deeply thoughtful. Yeah. Um, uh, smiling because I felt like I discovered this really amazing, beautiful space, um, and 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 it was, in a way, almost pristine, and then thoughtful because I felt, or I was thinking, wow, um, there's opportunity here, opportunity to build something. Um, so so in that case, it was you know randomly coming across some articles and then having this one you know, really um, this moment, this conversation uh, that, that set me on this journey to, um, to dive very, very deeply uh, into the industry over the last uh, five, five or so years. Um, I, uh, you know, I think, and, 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 and there was just, it was, it was all there. You know, you just had to you just had to open your eyes. It was it was all there in my mind. The numbers were there, the excitement was there. Uh, there it was it was kind of underground, quote unquote underground, um, and uh, it, it was all there. You just had to see it, open your eyes and see it. Um, you know, which I did, and uh, and I you know esports is this. Um, you know, it's a really it's it's a large industry much larger than, I mean, now a lot of people have come across it and um, the curtain has been lifted uh, of the industry and, and also gaming broadly, which, which, which sort of is, is engulfs or is, is, is around esports. Esports is a part of gaming broadly. And, um, and it's a, um, it's definitely a key part of the future of entertainment. Um, it already is. Um, I think uh, it, it's already, in part, the presence of uh, the presence, sorry, of entertainment. Um, it's it's already very global. Uh, I think we sometimes maybe think it's you know it's it's sort of isolated in specific regions or countries. It's it's actually truly global as an industry. Um, of course, the internet uh, helps in that regard. Internet and technology um, and creating this you know global esports um, ecosystem across many different games. Um, in some ways, it's, you know, it's akin to traditional sports in the sense that we have a lot of different games, um, uh, which we have in sports as well. We have soccer and basketball and baseball and football and hockey and so forth. Um, and in, in, in esports, we have the same. And just like in traditional sports, each sport has its own ecosystem, you know, just like each game has its own ecosystem. Some are more popular in other in certain countries and regions, and and um, you know some are bigger, some are smaller. You know, hockey is smaller than American football, for example, or soccer, and then soccer is the biggest of them all. Um, so, so I think uh, it, there are some similarities there, um, but uh, but I but I think we're just now seeing. Gen Z and then I guess Gen Alpha I think comes below that um, as as really taking to um, to gaming and within that I think to esports even more in some cases than they do to traditional sports. Um, you know, gaming has really become this um, phenomenal entertainment and social activity. Very important that it's a social activity not just doing this you know gaming is one of 
I'd say one of the most social things that you can do. You build friendships, you you develop this this circle, you communicate with people, you learn a lot of things like teamwork and other stuff. Um, And then, yeah, and then within that, we have esports as the highest, this pinnacle, this this, this competitive side of the gaming um, industry. And, And people love to compete. Simply put, people love to compete. You know, whether it's at marble races or uh, hot dog eating, <laughs> people love to compete. They love to compete at video games. I've always loved to compete at video games, whether it's in an arcade or on your smartphone. People love to compete. And, uh, and we're just, I think, at this very, and we're still in the early stages of seeing this industry truly flourish and, and, and I think be a part of just, uh, just like, everything that we're seeing on the entertainment and the content side. I think it's fascinating how you heard about it, had a conversation. We're we're so interested, but then also saw the opportunity. And then it sounds like you just submerged headfirst into it. Uh, And you can just tell by the passion in your voice, the way you're speaking about it, like how vested you are in it and what it does at just the human level. Uh, for relationships and teamwork and bonding and communicating in the comp- competitive drive of the, the human spirit. Uh, Chris, with, with that, what is your role uh, within esports? Uh, what is your role within esports today? And, and how do you see the industry evolving? Um, yeah, well, um, so, uh, so I wear. Uh, three hats in the space. Um, one, um, I advise uh, early stage startups, which really means uh, lots of uh, founder mentoring. So I I I, um, I, I, I mentor um, um, pre seed and seed stage uh, startups within esports and gaming, um, and um, it's really built around relationships with the founders um, and, 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 and helping them long-term on their journeys um, and, and hopefully making a small contribution to their success. Um, two, I invest uh, personally uh, into startups as well. Um, so the first is I invest my time. The second is I invest my capital. So both are investments, uh, just in different different forms. Uh, so I, I invest capital also into early stage startups within esports and gaming. Um, and then I also um, I co-found companies um, in the space. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, for example, right now uh, working uh, co-founding an uh, esports uh, betting platform, mm-hmm. uh, esports betting hub. Um, information content um, analysis hub. Um, also, um, um, co-founding an edtech gaming startup that's about um, facilitating kids uh, learning math through gaming. And um, and you know we know the shortage of uh, qualified people for STEM jobs and uh, and and how much that's going to be a problem in the next 10, 20 years. So you know I have to start early and. Uh, make a small contribution in that regard. Um, So those are the three hats that I wear. So I advise early stage companies, I invest in early stage companies, and then I co-found companies within esports and gaming. Um, In terms of where I see this industry going, um, one, I think more mainstream acceptance. Um, We we are in the uh, early to mid stages of that. Um, It's exciting for me to see Esports receive as much as attention as it has, and gaming broadly as well, right? Gaming as this this massive industry that's approaching 200 billion and you know three billion or 2.7 billion gamers around the world, um, and then a, a, a fraction or a small part of that is is, is esports. Um, mainstream acceptance is, I think, really important, um, and that goes deep into. Um, parents, schools at all levels, um, the business, the, the job world where, you know, it's become accepted to be a gamer, that that's something you can aspire to, that parents aren't, you know, sort of holding their kids back, but in the same way that they're allowing them to play basketball, they're allowing them to play you know, League of Legends, for example, if that's something that they aspire to, or even be a streamer for that matter, knowing, of course, that the chances of turning 
Pro are small, but there's lots of lessons and lots of value that you pick up along the way without just focus focusing on a professional career path. So mainstream acceptance, um, I think the industry will flourish massively in the next 10 or so years, uh, become neck and neck with traditional sports, sort of this bucket of esports and this bucket of traditional sports. I think they'll be neck and neck over the next decade plus, two decades in terms of size, in terms of um, in terms of meaning to this in the social fabric, you know, sports has this really important position within society. It brings people together. In some cases, it, it holds people together, and and I think esports can serve that uh, function as well in the years to come of bringing people together and holding people together through this, you know, competitive gaming environment. Um, and, um, you know, and I think we're going to see a, uh, um, a, you know, we're going to see a little bit of a ready player one future uh, where we're going to see some interesting, uh, you know, virtual reality immersive uh, games, both as participants and as, as spectators, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, but to, just generally, I'm a big believer that this industry will flourish um, significantly so, and that what that we will accept it as a key part of of entertainment, of competition, and and a part of the you know the fabric of society. Mm. Really big stuff, Chris, and I love watching you talk about it because I think you you see the potential clearly, not just. For the business side of it, but I think the human side of what esports can bring uh, to the social fabric of the world, not just football in the United States or soccer in Europe, but the entire social fabric of the world through a connective internet. Uh, so I'm I'm thrilled. I'm I'm excited to watch you kind of experiment, build within the niches of esports and what's to follow. And and thanks for sharing all your lessons, insights, and stories with us today. I cannot wait to share with our audience and i'm sure you know it'll help a lot of them and, and be fun to hear what your audience thinks as well well thank you so much for having me brian this was fun thank you yeah absolutely and last thing chris if people wanted to reach out follow you find you where would they go uh linkedin is best chris cheney on linkedin uh, i think linkedin.com slash in slash chris cheney <laughs> awesome. yeah find me on there great sounds good thanks chris thanks for being here thank you If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, I hope you leave a review on the platform of your choice and share it with a friend who you think would find it valuable. If you'd like to receive our written newsletter and thought leadership, head on over to bwmissions.com backslash newsletter and subscribe. See you on the next show.